lot of you are trying to find inspiration and motivation with a depressed mindset. You're depressed because you're not doing shit with yourself. You don't find inspiration by not living in the grip of life. You need to live in the grip of life to find inspiration. Put challenges in front of yourself. When you put a challenge in front of yourself and you attack it, that's when you find inspiration. Try to be 10% better than you were last week. So if you're running 30 miles a week, run 30 free. If you're swimming 500 meters, swim 550. If some of you aren't doing shit, you're 10% you're just getting off the couch. The more you walk away from accountability, the weaker you become. Find yourself in the grip of life. You can't find yourself by doing nothing. There's 200 people or 150 people that start the class. There's a hundred helmets of people that quit. Grown men whose dream it was to be a SEAL that get there, that did all this physical training and all this preparation and signed that dotted line and committed to six years and they show up there and they get to that training and they ring that bell. No one knows who's gonna make it through that program. The only way to know what's in the core of a human being is to rip that thing apart and see what's in there. And until you rip it apart and see what's in there, you don't know. What does it take to not ring the bell? Don't quit. People always ask me, what should I concentrate on, dude? What's, what's your advice for me going to buzz? Don't quit. Don't quit. Like, train hard, don't quit. What starts here changes the world. I have a few suggestions that may help you on your way to a better world. And while these lessons were learned during my time in the military, I can assure you that it matters not whether you ever served a day in uniform. It matters not your gender, your ethnic or religious background, your orientation or your social status. Our struggles in this world are similar and the lessons to overcome those struggles and to move forward changing ourselves and changing the world around us will apply equally to all. So here are the 10 lessons I learned from basic SEAL training that hopefully will be of value to you as you move forward in life. Every morning in SEAL training, my instructors, who at the time were all Vietnam veterans, would show up in my barracks room, and the first thing they'd do was inspect my bed. If you did it right, the corners would be square, the covers would be pulled tight, the pillow centered just under the headboard, and the extra blanket folded neatly at the foot of the rack. It was a simple task, mundane at best, but every morning we were required to make our bed to perfection. It seemed a little ridiculous at the time, particularly in light of the fact that we were aspiring to be real warriors, tough, battle-hardened seals. But the wisdom of this simple act has been proven to me many times over. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride and it will encourage you to do another task and another and another. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. And if by chance you have a miserable day, you will come home to a bed that is made, that you made. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. So if you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. Hey, I'm turning out to be a loser. I mean, the kind of guy that no young person wants to be. Fresh out of high school, attending a local community college. I didn't have any real big plans. I wasn't passing any of my classes. Now the end of the year is coming up. It's time to take finals. And I didn't study for these tests. And as I'm pulling into the school parking lot, I think that's where I was really confronted with it. Like it hit me like, hey, I'm turning out to be a loser. I mean, the kind of guy that no young person wants to be. I'm not making it at school. I'm sitting there in my truck and I think I come up with the perfect plan. I know what I'm gonna do to turn this all around. I'm gonna go become an Alaskan crab fisherman. I'm thinking, deadliest catch. I'm watching it on Discovery Channel. Like that's by far one of the most dangerous jobs. There's some honor in that. And I almost settled on that. 
When the other idea popped into my brain, like, wait, no, why can't I go join the military? And not just that, I wanna be a part of the most elite. I wanna be a US Navy SEAL. And so my first order of business is this. If I'm gonna be a frogman, I don't need to go to school anymore. I started my truck up and took off out of that school parking lot. Never took those tests. And of course, I gotta let my dad know some bad news and good news as I phrased it. So I kind of let him know what's going on at school, not really passing any of the classes. And of course, he's kind of face palming like, oh, the good news, hey, it's all right, dad, I got a plan. I'm gonna be a Navy SEAL. And so I'm just doing the preparation, all the running and swimming. And as days go by, he invites me inside one day up into his room. He says, okay, so you really want to do this, huh? You want to be a SEAL? I'm like, yeah, dad, I want to be a SEAL. He goes, great. I set up a workout for you with the Navy SEAL. Check out my computer screen. And I'll never forget, as I'm looking over the computer, my thought is, my dad doesn't have any Navy SEAL friends. Like, who is this? And I see in this email just says, can Chad come out and play tomorrow? I'm like, play? Like, dad, let me get this straight. You, you met some guy off the internet, says he wants to play with me, and you're arranging all this right now. I was like, all right, I guess, you know, I'm gonna go meet up with the guy. And so as it turns out, there's more of a conversation he had with this man on the phone that I had no, like I had no knowledge of prior to that email. So as it turns out, on the phone, he gets on the phone with this guy, says, hey, look, my son wants to be a Navy SEAL, but here's the deal. He has no idea what he's getting involved in. He doesn't know what he's signing up for. So I'm just asking, could you do me a really big favor? I, I need you to meet up with my son. I quit my corporate finance job and joined the United States Navy with the dream of becoming a SEAL. A decision, of course, that would forever change my life and set me on the path that I'm on today. So one day I was having a conversation with my twin brother. He's like, Brent, you've got to be kidding me. Seals? Like, are you, you're not being serious, right? I'll, I'll admit, I, I don't even really know much about it, but I know one thing. There is no way in hell you could ever do that. I mean, let's face it, these, aren't these guys supposed to be, I don't know, world-class warriors or something? Like really tough guys? You are not tough at all. Again, don't know much about it, but I'm pretty certain SEALs aren't nerdy, sniffly, emotional guys who cry during the Clorox bleach commercial. So let's just forget we had this conversation and stick with your nerdy fights. Well, now I knew I had to do it, right? This is a true story. Literally a week later, I quit my job and my buddy, whom I'd been training with, moved up here to Crested Butte, Colorado, where we trained for an additional six months for five hours a day at 10,000 feet altitude get into the best physical condition that we could. Then in early 2000, joined the Navy, and after a couple months of basic training, I was on a plane headed out to sunny San Diego, California, where we would begin our journey. I can tell you with exact certainty and clarity like it was yesterday that I have never been more nervous in my entire life than the day I stepped foot into the lobby of the Naval Special Warfare Training Center. Let me see if I can fix myself. So I said, if I can just walk one more mile after being in the worst shape of my entire life, this would change everything for me mentally going forward. From this kid who came from dirt and nothing, who couldn't read until he was in a junior in high school, and is now here, I went, I walked a mile. I said, hmm, maybe I can walk one more mile. Maybe I can walk another mile. At mile 81, my ex-wife looked at me and said, you're not gonna make the time. When your mind knows it's not going to quit, and this is what I found out, this is my 40% rule. When your mind knows it's not going to quit, your body will adapt to whatever is in front of it. I ended up running 20 more miles, I did 101 miles in 19 hours and 6 minutes. And that one day changed, that one 19 hours, it wasn't SEAL training, it wasn't Ranger School, it wasn't Delta Force, it wasn't any of that crap I went through. It was this 19 hours and six minutes that forever changed my life to know that we as human beings are capable of anything and we don't need any special kind of parents or tools to get there. So I end you with this. Don't stop when you're tired. Stop when you're done. Thank you very much. Come on. Get it. 17. They don't know me, son. Get it. 18. They don't know me, son. Get it. 19! Yeah, big son! Yeah! 20, you got some more in here! 21! Yeah, get it again! Come on, we want to see it! Good! 22! Who's going to carry the boats and the logs? That's you, buddy! Come on, 23! Come on, 24! One more, Damon! Who's one more? to carry the boats 
You're gonna do it. You're gonna do it. You're gonna do it. You did it. Yeah. I wait longer. And this goes on for probably 30 seconds or a minute, which is a really long time when you're trying to take down a target. And finally, I said to myself, all right, I'm gonna see what's going on. So I actually point my weapon at the ceiling and I take a step back and I just look around. And, and I see that every single person in my platoon, including my platoon commander, including the assistant platoon commander, including the platoon leading petty officer, everyone is just focused on their weapons and no one's making a decision. And I can see this. And because I'm looking around and I'm detached from the scenario, just by, just by eight inches I stepped back. Stepped back and looked around. I can see what decision needs to be made. And so I, I summoned up as much courage as I could as a new guy, because new guys don't make decisions. And I said, hold left, clear right, which is a basic command that we had rehearsed and you would practice. And I expected someone to say, you know, shut up, <laughs> shut up, Jocko. But instead they repeated the command. They all said, hold left, clear right, which means we were gonna execute. And sure enough, the guys on the left held and the guys on the right cleared. And we, we got done and instead of someone saying, hey, you need to keep your mouth shut, like one of the more senior guys said, hey, good job up there, way to make a call. So I looked at it and I said, wait a second, how could I have, a, as a new guy, have made a decision in that situation that was better than what the more senior, more experienced guys were making? And I realized it was because I took a step back and detached from it. So at that moment, I said to myself, okay, from now on, when I get into these tactical scenarios, I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to try and look around and I'm going to try and detach myself from the chaos and the mayhem. And I started doing it all the time in every tactical situation, in the land warfare, in the mountains, in the urban environments. I was doing it all the time and I was able to like see what was happening. It was like a superpower to be able to see what was happening and make decisions. And so then I actually started doing it when I was having conversations. And if you and I were in a disagreement and you started getting emotional, instead of me getting emotional back at you, I would just take a step back and be like, oh, okay, he's really, he's really concerned about this. Why is he so concerned? What does he see that I don't see? And I started actually just detaching all the time. And that became a very powerful tool in leadership that I use to this day. During SEAL training, the students during training, the students are all broken down into boat crews. Each crew is seven students, three on each side of a small rubber boat, and one coxswain to help guide the dinghy. Every day, your boat crew forms up on the beach and is instructed to get through the surf zone and paddle several miles down the coast. In the winter, the surf off San Diego can get to be eight to 10 feet high, and it is exceedingly difficult to paddle through the plunging surf unless everyone digs in. Every paddle, must be synchronized to the stroke count of the coxswain. Everyone must exert equal effort or the boat will turn against the wave and be unceremoniously dumped back on the beach. For the boat to make it to its destination, everyone must paddle. You can't change the world alone. You will need some help. And to truly get from your starting point to your destination takes friends, colleagues, the goodwill of strangers, and a strong coxswain to guide you. If you want to change the world, find someone to help you paddle. Over a few weeks of difficult training, my SEAL class, which started with 150 men, was down to just 42. There were now six boat crews of seven men each. I was in the boat with the tall guys, but the best boat crew we had was made up of the little guys, the Munchkin crew, we called them. No one was over five foot five. The Munchkin boat crew had one American Indian, one African American, one Polish American, one Greek American, one Italian American, and two tough kids from the Midwest. They out paddled, out ran, and out swam all the other boat crews. The big men in the other boat crews would always make good natured fun of the tiny little flippers the Munchkins put on their tiny little feet prior to every swim. But somehow these little guys from every corner of the nation and the world always had the last laugh, swimming faster than everyone and reaching the shore long before the rest of us. Give him a wake-up call. Just bury him. Beat this desire becoming a seal out of him. So, the guy thought about it for a while, and he decides to reply back in the email, can Chad come out and play tomorrow? 
So I don't know what that is all about, but I'm about to go find out as I meet up with this Navy SEAL in a beach parking lot. He spots me right away. You, Chad? Yes, sir. All right, Bubba. I was Bubba from that point forward. Get on over here. He's got me dropped down, doing push-ups and sit-ups. He brings a portable pull-up bar you can hang from anywhere. So I'm doing pull-ups outside the bathroom, like at the beach in front of people. I'm kind of hanging in there, doing the things that he wants me to do. He says, all right, Bubba, why don't you go for this run, you know, 15 minutes down the trail, out into the wetlands and uh, away from the ocean. And 15 minutes into it, you take over, and then I'll be there with you 15 minutes into the run. It takes 18 months and costs about $3 million to acquire one season. And that doesn't count the millions of dollars and years of arduous training once you actually make it to a team. That 18 months is broken into various segments. The first segment is six months long and called BUDS. Another one of our acronyms, it stands for Basic Underwater Demolition Seal. BUDS has a 90% failure rate of highly capable candidates. None of us are extraordinary, exceptional individuals. We're just common people with an uncommon desire to succeed. So imagine those types of activities going on for months and months at a time. And then the irony is that the training just gets more difficult after that. So the third week of BUDS, the third week of this 18 month training pipeline is called Hell Week. And I assure you it's a lot worse than that sounds. It's designed to do one thing, simply weed out those not committed to the vision of becoming a SEAL. You do not sleep for an entire week. You run the equivalent of multiple marathons while wet and sandy inside and out. This is called getting a sugar cookie. It sucks because the instructors make a concerted effort to ensure you get the sand on the inside of your clothing so that it strips the flesh off your body as you run. It's like wearing sandpaper inside out. You swim dozens of miles in the open frigid ocean. You run with heavy logs, heavy boats, heavy backpacks. You run the obstacle course multiple times a day. Endless calisthenics, brutal beatings. All while battling severe bruising, cuts, lacerations, stress fractures, cellulitis, broken bones, things that seemed uncomfortable or things that seemed almost seemingly impossible become a part of your everyday life. And that winning mindset of persistence and determination reminds me of a great quote by Martin Luther King Jr. that says, if you can't fly, you run. If you can't run, you walk. If you can't walk, you crawl. But no matter what, you keep moving forward. One thing that changed my life is my grandfather. He told me, you're going nowhere in your life. Not being anything. As bad as that hurt me, it got me to pull my head out of my ass. So learn to stay hard, to have thick skin, and do what's right. What you need is the one thing I talked about in my book, which is straight up, brutal work ethic. You have to be willing to outwork everybody in the world. And that, that, that's the hard part. That's the hard part. This isn't like some five step process where you can do these five steps, you're gonna end up with this magical world. No, I'm basically teaching you how to callous over your victim's mentality. This is all about the quitting mind. So what's the quitting mind? So let's say it's day one of a job interview. You have your clothes laid out. You've been preparing for weeks and weeks and weeks. You show up and you bring your best self. After a couple months, you start showing up to work a little later. You don't look as good. Your breakfast isn't ready. Your mind's getting softer. Repetition every day. Stay hard most important conversation is the one you have with yourself. You wake up with it, you walk around with it, you go to bed with it, eventually you act on it. We live in a world now that's so kind. We, we find the kind way around everything. Like, if you don't look good, I have to find a kind way of saying, I don't like your shirt. Right. That's not the approach. If that's the approach you're looking for, that book is not for you. Mm. Can't hurt me is not for you. The approach you have to take, at least I took, you take whatever approach you want. The conversation had to be a real honest conversation in the accountability mirror, guess what? I was fat. Don't find a kind word to say that, you know what, I've gained some weight. No, you're fat. When I couldn't read, not like, hey, you know, even learn disability. No, I cannot read. Before fourth grade reading level, I'm struggling 
And sometimes I call myself stupid, not in a way to put myself down. Sometimes you act on it good, sometimes bad. You gotta change the internal dialogue. That person in your head that's talking that sh to you, until you change the internal dialogue in your head, until you callous over the victim's mentality that the world is out to get you because of you are the only, you gotta change that sh My second platoon, our platoon commander, the guy actually in charge of the whole platoon, he's not very experienced. He didn't listen, he didn't take advice, he didn't take guidance. Everything was like his way or the highway. And we had a mutiny inside of our platoon. We went to our commanding officer and said, hey, sir, we don't wanna work for our platoon commander. He, he doesn't listen, he's arrogant. And eventually what ended up happening was, this guy got fired as our platoon commander. And that left an impact on me because as I'm watching this going, I'm thinking to myself, why don't we like this guy? Why doesn't anyone wanna to listen to this guy? Why don't we wanna follow this guy? And the reason, because he was arrogant and he didn't listen and he didn't give us any ownership of everything. Everything was about him. And that would, that would have made an impression on me. That, that would have left a mark. But the mark got left even more clearly because when that guy got fired, the guy that came in and took over for him was, was like, I hate to use the word legendary, but he was a pretty legendary SEAL, had a ton of experience. He'd come up through the ranks and he had been stationed at every different kind of SEAL team and he took over as our platoon commander. And I kind of thought to myself, well, he's gonna take over because we're a bunch of mutineers and they need to put someone really strong that's gonna like whip us back into shape. So I was anticipating that we were gonna have this super hardcore guy. And, and this guy shows up and he's got a nice smile on his face and he's super humble. And I remember the, one of the first things he said to us was like, I look forward to working with you guys. SEAL training was a great equalizer. Nothing mattered but your will to succeed, not your color, not your ethnic background, not your education, not your social status. If you want to change the world, measure a person by the size of their heart, not by the size of their flippers. Several times a week, the instructors would line up the class and do a uniform inspection. It was exceptionally thorough. Your hat had to be perfectly starched, your uniform immaculately pressed, your belt buckle shiny and void of any smudges. But it seemed that no matter how much effort you put into starching your hat or pressing your uniform or polishing your belt buckle, it just wasn't good enough. The instructors would find something wrong. For failing uniform inspection, the student had to run, fully clothed, into the surf zone, then wet from head to toe, roll around on the beach until every part of your body was covered with sand. The effect was known as sugar cookie. You stayed in the uniform the rest of the day, cold, wet, and sandy. There were many a student who just couldn't accept the fact that all their efforts were in vain, that no matter how hard they tried to get the uniform right, it went unappreciated. Those students didn't make it through training. Those students didn't understand the purpose of the drill. You were never gonna succeed. You were never gonna have a perfect uniform. The instructors weren't going to allow it. Sometimes, no matter how well you prepare, or how well you perform, you still end up as a sugar cookie. It's just the way life is sometimes. If you want to change the world, get over being a sugar cookie and keep moving forward. Every day during training, you were challenged with multiple physical events, long runs, long swims, obstacle courses, hours of calisthenics, something designed to test your mettle. Every event had standards, times you had to meet. If you failed to meet those times, those standards, your name was posted on a list, and at the end of the day, those on the list were invited to a circus. A circus was two hours of additional calisthenics designed to wear you down, to break your spirit, to force you to quit. No one wanted a circus. A circus meant that for that day, you didn't measure up. A circus meant more fatigue, and more fatigue meant that the following day would be more difficult and more circuses were likely. But at some time during SEAL training, Everyone, everyone made the circus list. Have an ethos, a creed that embodies our culture and our values. And a similar line from that ethos says, I will not quit. I persevere and thrive in adversity. And if knocked down, I will get back up every time. I am never out of the fight. And that winning mindset is how each and every one of you, all of us, can continue to take point in our own lives 
to push the confines of our comfort zone, to push the limits, to take calculated risks, to succeed and win, and to be all in all the time. If you think about that, that mindset, that winning mindset, winning here is a conscious decision. You will make up your mind whether you want to pass or you're going to choose to fail. Keep moving no matter what. Find an excuse to win. You can push yourself further than your mind or body ever thought possible. Bud's training is based on the rule of seven. When your brain is telling you that you can go no further and take no more pain, you can go seven times longer, seven times more, and push yourself seven times harder. And again, that's why very few people make it through this selection process. I wanted to tell you guys a brief story about trust from my Bud's classes Hell Week experience. The students have no idea when Hell Week will commence. The anxiety, the anguish is literally eating away at your soul. And as a way to uh, inspire us and motivate us, our class leader, who is uh, the highest ranking officer in your class, he read to us the St. Crispin's Day speech from William Shakespeare's Henry V. And he read aloud those famed lines that say, we few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. John died four days later. We were four and a half days into Hell Week. There were only about 30 students left at the 250. We were in full gear, no fins, in an Olympic-sized swimming pool doing relay races. Four and a half days into Hell Week, you're hallucinating so violently, your body is so brutally beaten. It's more of an evolution in controlled drowning. Long story short, John suffered a massive heart failure and drowned in the pool right next to us. But again, we were hallucinating so violently and so exhausted at that point, nobody had any idea what was going on. So they ran us back across the street to the Special Warfare Center and they put us in the classroom where we waited for a couple hours. And after a couple hours, the door opens and the instructor staff walk in and with them was the commanding officer of BUDS at the time. I once had that mentality that no one understands what the f I'm going through. And if you keep that mentality, you're gonna stay in the same exact spot that you're in, that no one understands me. There's a whole, there's millions of people. Why do you think a book that I self-published, you know, is doing so well? With a story that's so f***ed up. People are like, I'll never forget what I went to a publishing house, like, who's gonna resonate with this story? And I was, it, the, the, that word right there, I'm gonna work with you guys. Not, not I'm in charge, I'm glad I'm taking over, I'm glad to be your commander. There's nothing like that, he said, hey, I'm looking forward to working with you guys. So all of a sudden, it was totally different. And he started putting us in charge of things. Instead of him coming up with a plan, he would say, hey, you guys come up with a plan and let me know how you wanna do it. And all of a sudden, we had all this ownership and that made me reflect on the way the first guy had acted compared to the way this guy had acted. And I realized how important it was to be a humble leader and to listen to other people and to give ownership to other people. In the third platoon, it was a good solid platoon and we had a good platoon commander and we were out in the desert doing some training and uh, some targets popped up. We start engaging the targets like we're supposed to and everyone gets in the prone position and is returning fire. And I did what I had been doing this whole time, which was detach. I kind of took a step back, took, shot a couple rounds, then kind of pulled back and looked to see what was going on. And I saw the call that needed to be made. And I gave the platoon commander a couple seconds to make a call, and he didn't make it. So, you know, I, call, I made the call, peel left. And everyone said, okay, peel left. And we peeled left and we left the scenario and we got our distance and then we stopped the training exercise. And we did a little debrief. And during the debrief, the platoon commander, you know, he said to me, well, why did you make that call? And I said, well, I can see what we needed to do, you know, and you hadn't made a call, so I, I you know, I, I made the call. And he goes, well, I actually didn't want to peel left. I wanted to assault the target. 